Today on Ancient DOS Games, we're doing Snarf, which might sound like a strange name for a game, but it's actually really straightforward and really easy to play. And I don't really have much to say about it, so let's just kick it off and roll in the game stats. Snarf was created by Everett Kayser in 1988, though he didn't officially release the game until 1990. It's a one-player action arcade game, and here's the part I find most interesting. This game runs in a 640x350 high resolution EGA 16 color mode. And what that means is that, well, if you do the math, 640 and 350, the pixels on screen are almost twice as tall vertically as they are wide. So what ends up happening is a lot of games made in this graphics mode tend to have this sort of vertically elongated appearance. But if you actually take one of these games and stretch it to a widescreen display, suddenly all the pixels become their correct size, and you actually get a widescreen game that wasn't originally made to be widescreen. And I find that really cool. And that's something you can do with DOSBox even, and I'll tell you more about those settings later in the episode. The game only has PC speaker sound, unfortunately, but its release date as of January 2008 has been freeware, but only if you download it from the RGB Classic Games website, which you can find at www.classicdosgames.com. So those of you familiar with old arcade games probably already know what this game takes after. There's an old arcade game called Tutankham, which they wanted to call Tutankhamun, but the name wouldn't actually fit on the arcade cabinet. <laughs> That's a really good reason to shorten the name of your game. Anyways, the game Tutankham, the idea was that you had these different treasures you had to collect, and enemies would spawn out of pits, and you had to dodge them, go through these labyrinths, get to the end, survive, of course, and you know, get as many points as you can. It was an arcade game. And this game is pretty much the same kind of thing, except unlike Tutankham, you can actually fire up and down as well as side to side. Yeah, in the original arcade game Tutankham, you could only fire left and right, you couldn't fire up and down. Kind of weird like that. However, one of the great things about this game is that you don't have to fire in the direction you're moving in. Your movement controls and your firing controls are completely independent. So you can move in one direction while firing in another, like moving right while you fire left, moving up while you fire left, moving left while you fire left, you know, whichever needs to be the way to get through a certain situation. But you do have to be really careful about firing your shots because you can only have one or two shots in the air at a time, selectable at the game start. The reason why you would want to play with only one shot in the air at a time instead of two is if you want a higher score because in the one shot mode your score is doubled. And let's talk about the scoring now because that's an interesting part of this game. First of all, the enemies aren't worth any points at all. You could shoot like hundreds of them down, but you won't get a single point for them. All the points are in the treasure, which you can get the blue rings, which are worth one point, the red rings, which are worth five, the green rings, which are worth ten, or the crowns, which are worth a hundred points. And then at the end of the level, the number of tags you have left multiply in to the amount of points that you collected for the level. And the tags are sort of like your hit points. If you get hit by an enemy, you lose a tag. And if you're continually hit by enemies, you can lose tags really fast. And if you run out of tags, the game's over. But since the tags are part of your scoring, this means that sometimes actually getting hit just once by an enemy can cost you more points than trying to get a really hard to get treasure, if you're only getting like like a few rings or something. So that makes it really interesting in deciding how to go through a level, whether you risk going for a treasure or save your tags so that you don't lose all those points at the end of the level. The Snarfs are no pushovers either. They are not stupid and they will dodge your attacks when you shoot at them. Plus, they will just run around, get as close to you as possible, taking paths to get in it close and get around you. It's really hard to get away from these guys sometimes, and they move at the same speed you do. So that's why it's best to take them out only if you absolutely have to. Under all other circumstances, run away from them. You only have the ability to shoot one or two shots at a time, and if they get stuck in the air going down a long corridor, you're defenseless. You've got to stay away from these guys as much as you can. If you do get trapped by them, then try and make it so that they have to go down a very narrow path where you can just shoot a shot and it only takes like a split second to hit a wall. That way you can just rapidly fire them and the snarf should run right into your fire. Beyond killing snarfs and collecting treasure though, you also have to worry about a couple other elements on the board. First of all, there's the teleporters. And the teleporters are 
kind of evil. You go through one teleporter and you end up somewhere else on the board, not necessarily from another teleporter. And you'll find this happens in a lot of the later levels where the teleporters are all over the place and none of them teleport you where you think they're going to. So you gotta get used to that, and it is gonna take quite a bit of getting used to. And the other thing you have to worry about are the keys and the locked doors. You can only carry one key at a time for some mysterious reason. Maybe the keys are like radioactive and you can't carry too many, or maybe they're really heavy, so you have to like drag it around or something. I don't know, for some obscure moon logic reason, you can only have one key at a time. So you carry one key at a time, bring it to a door, and unlock it. The other thing you gotta worry about though is that some of the levels, particularly one that's early in the game, you have to make sure to unlock the doors in the correct order, otherwise you won't be able to get all the keys needed to get to the end of the level, you'll be stuck, and you'll have to stop the game and, you know, start over again. Which is pretty frustrating. That's why when you actually start a level, the whole level fills the screen and nothing happens until you start moving. So just take a moment at the start of the level to look over the level, make sure you know where all the keys are, which order you should unlock the doors in, and then get yourself started with it. Now there's 51 levels in the game, and even though you can start the game at any point so that you don't have to get through certain levels, you might get bored of those levels, and if you do, you can always just make your own. If you're in the middle of gameplay, you can push the F1 key, and that brings up a level editor. And the level editor is extremely easy to use. All you gotta do is just use the arrow keys to move a cursor around the screen, and then various buttons on the keyboard will place certain kinds of objects. And the interesting thing is that even though it edits the level that you were currently on when you push F1, it won't automatically save it overwriting the original level. It will actually let you save completely new levels so that you can create your own series of levels or if you do really want to, you can overwrite the original levels, but why would you do that? I don't know. And there's also room at the bottom where you see the name and the well, two names, sort of. One name for the name of the board, and one name for the author who created the board itself. And you, there's more to it than just this, because you can also hit the F2 key to change the color of the walls, which is pretty handy. Or you can hit the F3 key and just create your own walls entirely. And that means there's plenty of variety to making the levels, so to speak. You know, it you will eventually start to run out of ideas for the levels, because there's only so much you can do with a game that's this simple. And that really is the only sticking point, is it's a very simple game. The replay value isn't that high once you're... well, I guess it depends. If you're a person who likes those kind of arcade-style games where you just rack up the points and try to get as high a score as possible, you will enjoy this game. Otherwise, you'll probably only want to try it once or twice. Now let's talk about getting this game running in DOSBox. Most of the default DOSBox settings are going to be fine. There's just one interesting thing. This is one of the few DOS games I know of that doesn't run properly in DOSBox if you set a fixed cycles count. The crazy thing is that it's usually the other way around. Usually using the auto setting causes problems, but here you need to set the cycles count to auto, otherwise you'll either slow the game down on a considerable amount with too slow a fixed setting, or if the fixed setting is higher than necessary, it will cause the graphics to flicker horribly. So the auto setting is the way to go, so make sure cycles is set to auto. And as for the graphics filters, of course they all look good with a game like this, but here's something interesting you can do, specifically if you have a widescreen computer monitor. What you want to do is set the full screen resolution to the size of your widescreen monitor, so if you have a 1920 by 1080 monitor like me, that's what you would set it to. And then make sure your output mode is set to Direct Draw or OpenGL, because that way the screen will stretch properly. And now here's what you do with the render settings. Set the aspect correction to false, and then set the filter type to HQ3X space forced. Now the forced is kind of necessary because DOSBox likes to make its own decisions about when to use certain filters, so the force setting forces it to use a certain filter, and this is why the direct draw and OpenGL settings are necessary for the output mode because this way if it gets too big it's stretched properly into the correct space. And the end result? A widescreen game made in DOS before widescreens were available for computers. Now, how cool is that? Anyways, that's all I got to say about Snarf, so stay tuned for episode 16 of Ancient DOS Games, where I'm going to be covering a first-person shooter that takes place a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. 
I suspect a lot of you already know what game it is, so make sure to send in your guess as soon as possible to 80g at pixelships.com, and stay tuned for the next episode to see if you got your name in the credits.